Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to another installment of Golondrinas Live Sessions. My name is Laura Gonzalez, the Education and Volunteer Manager here at El Rancho de las Golondrinas Living History Museum. We're located just south of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the beautiful and historic La Cienega Valley. Joining me today to talk about the traditional methods of adobe making and adobe historic preservation are two very special guests, the uh, assistant museum director, Mr. Sean Palahimo, who's also the director of operations here on site, and Las Golondrinas board member and dear friend, Michael Romero Taylor. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. If you have any questions or comments about it, please feel free to leave those in the, uh, in the comments there. Thank you, Laura. And thank you for being here, Mr. Taylor. Um, as Laura said, Mike is a Michael is a board member and a dear friend, and has also been involved here at El Rancho de las Golondrinas for over 40 years. And we're very proud and happy to have him here today. Uh, Mike Romero Taylor has been working for the past 40 years in historic preservation. His experience includes historic site management, architectural conservation management of cultural routes, museum and visitor center management, and archeological site preservation. He has worked in historic preservation with an emphasis on earthen architecture, site management, and cultural routes in Latin America, Europe, and Asia. And he just recently, congratulations, retired in 2019 from the Park Service working as a cultural resource specialist for nine congressionally designated historic trails in the United States, including our very own Camino Real, which we have a piece of running through the Las Golondrinas property. So without further ado, Mike's gonna give his presentation on adobe preservation, and then I'm gonna do a little demonstration on making adobe clay and a little plastering demonstration here behind us. So, Mike. Thanks very much, Sean. I, I uh, had forgotten I'd been here for about 40 years off and on. <laughs> I had the pleasure of working with, with uh, Sean's father here in the, in the mid-1970s. Well, we're, we're very fortunate to be here at this incredible property, Rancho de los Gondrinas. It covers over 400 acres. And on this property are some incredible examples of adobe. And that's why we're here today, is to talk about these adobe buildings. But I thought we'd first uh, look a little bit at what Adobe is, look at some of the examples around the world, and um, get into then get into the actual Adobe preservation aspects of, of what we're doing. Uh, the first slide uh, that we're going to be looking at is a slide of, of Taos Pueblo, the large image. Taos Pueblo is, of course, located in, in northern New Mexico about a two hour drive from uh, where we are here at La, La Cienega. And Taos Pueblo is one of the uh, longest inhabited uh, historic adobe buildings uh, in this country. And it's also listed um, as a World Heritage Site, uh, listed back in the 1990s. It's one of three sites in New Mexico that are on the World Heritage List. And um, one of 24 sites that are listed uh, here in this country out of a total of about a thousand worldwide. So we're very fortunate to have this site as a, as a World Heritage property. The image on the right is uh, Baca Placita. And um, if we go to the next slide, we'll be able to see some examples of the adobes here on the property. And so this next slide um, shows uh, four images of adobes here. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more adobes on the site than what we're looking at here, but I thought we'd just take a look at four of the ones that are more salient to the property. The image on the upper left is of the Golondrinas Placita. This uh, Placita that we can actually see, see from here at the Pino House is a property that was built in the early uh, 1970s, more or less, on top of foundations uh, that were supposedly reportedly original to the site dating from the 1700s. Uh, this is the, the place that a lot of the guests first come to. It's, it's an incredible property and it's one that's all made out of adobe. 
uh, with the exception of the barn, which is in part made out of stone. Uh, the image just below that is the Mora House, and the Mora House was built as well in the early 1970s to uh, depict uh, a building in the northern mountain villages. And luckily for this building, uh, up in the northern mountain villages especially, we have uh, pitched roofs, especially because of the harsh winters that sheds the snow. The image in the middle is of the Morada. Uh, this is a replica that was also built as part of the museum started in the early 1970s. And this Morada is a replica, a smaller replica of um, a building uh, from Abiquiu, a Morada from Abiquiu. And the story of the Penitentes in New Mexico is really just uh, incredible. And please come to the museum to learn more about that. The image on the right is of the Baca uh, house, and this Baca house is really probably one of the most historic buildings on site. The, the walls on this property date to uh, the, 19, the 1840s. So all of these buildings that you see here, along with a number of other buildings, um, are dealt with in terms of preservation through a very rigorous cyclical maintenance program that Sean, who you just met, and his crew uh, faithfully maintain year by year, uh, depending on the needs after the storms. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see um, a little description of what Adobe is. Uh, Sean will be getting into this more, but basically Adobe is a dried mud brick combining the natural elements of earth, water, and the sun. In the United States, adobe is the most prevalent in the hot, arid Southwest. And adobe is basically dirt, and we'll be seeing some dirt in just a minute. Um, an ideal adobe brick, shouldn't say ideal, but a typical of adobe brick usually has about 70% sand. Uh, and the rest, the uh, silk clay, the clay serving as a binder for the sand. And then if you see on this image right here of uh, some adoberos making adobes at this adobe yard, you'll see a, a bale of straw, and that's what you would use uh, to sprinkle into your adobe mix to help cut down on the, on the shrinkage. So adobe is, uh, is the oldest and most widely available material used to build with. We'll be looking at a few examples of this, of this in a minute. It's very sustainable and environmentally friendly and uh, it's much more durable than one may think. There's, there's buildings made out of adobe, earthen architecture around the world. They're literally thousands of years old. And really all you need to have a building like that last that long is to be able to protect it from what we call the falling damp, the rains and the snows, and, and moisture from the base. And on, as we go to the next slide, we're going to be looking at a little bit about where you're going to find adobe. And of course, around Santa Fe, where we're located, Santa Fe really brands itself as, as the adobe capital of the Southwest. It's really uh, something that you see on all the glossy magazines. Invariably, you're going to be seeing a wonderful adobe building as part of their marketing technique for bringing people to the Southwest and to Santa Fe. There's an image of the Taos Pueblo up on your right uh, with a dog in front of it. But just below that, I wanted to show you uh, a building that I had the great pleasure of working in for 18 years. This is a National Park Service building located in Santa Fe. And it's a building totally made out of adobe, made in 1938, made out of thousands and thousands of adobe bricks. And the dirt from the adobe bricks was really secured on site and it, the way it was secured on site is they, two, they dug two large holes, and those large holes are now huge basements underneath this building. This is a wonderful edifice. It's uh, a little bit of trivia. It's the oldest uh, uh, and uh, largest office building made out of adobe in the United States. Um, so please, uh, when, it, when you get a chance, uh, please visit this building. It's really worth your time. The building on the bottom is the Palace of the Governors. This is the, the building that's uh, the oldest continuously used government building in the United States, built originally in 1609 and still used as a government building uh, today as a public museum. 
It's a National Historic Landmark, and this building has gone through a lot of renovations, but the point is that it's been maintained quite a bit through the years. The image on the, on the left is of the San Miguel Mission, and the San Miguel Mission is really the, the oldest adobe building that we have in Santa Fe area, uh, pre Pueblo Revolt, meaning it was uh, built before 1680s, and the wall in 1680, and the walls are, are original supposedly to that time period. So that's an example of buildings that we have locally and regionally. Let's go to the next image, the next slide, and we'll, we'll see uh, this incredible picture of a, of a property in Morocco. This underscores the fact that um, Adobe is just not a Santa Fe phenomena. Earthen architecture, and we'll see some examples of earthen architecture in just a minute, other styles of earthen architecture, is really uh, all over the world, nationally and internationally. Even here in the United States, around the Southwest, of course, we have great Adobe buildings in New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Texas, uh, Colorado. But there's also adobe buildings up in New York State, New Jersey, Louisiana, places where you'd never imagine finding something like this. So going to the next image, we're talking about um, the types of earth and architecture. Now, adobe is just one type of building with earth. Adobe brick was introduced here in the Southwest uh, in the 17th century, actually 1598 with Oñate's expedition. But uh, that's the adobe brick that was introduced. The actual use of, of earthen architecture as a, as a building material was used for thousands and thousands of years here in the United States, and especially here in the Southwest by the indigenous populations. And the type of, uh, type of building that was used, type of earthen architecture that was used has variously been called puddled or coarse adobe, basically placing wet placed mud on top of a on top of a wall as you begin it and working around as you would a clay pot. There's other types of earthen architecture. There's cob, which is very prevalent in Europe, uh, especially uh, Ireland and England. Uh, Hakal is another different type of uh, architecture using earth. It's basically vertical wooden post, as you see in the lower right-hand corner, with horizontal uh, thatching, and then it's daubed with mud. And Pise, is rammed earth. Pise is a rammed earth type of uh, architecture that is used quite a bit in, uh, in Europe. And Teron, I failed to mention that part of the Baca house is made of Teron, which is cut sod, and it's made out of cut sod from here because we're so close to the, the great springs that we have here on the ranch. So the bottom line is that there's over a third of the world's population lives in some type of earth and architecture. It's really uh, an amazing building material and uh, we're lucky here in the Southwest and especially here at the ranch to have such a great collection of adobe buildings. Going to the next slide, I just wanted to reiterate about what earth and architecture is. It's one of the most originally, original and powerful expressions of our ability to create a built environment with readily available resources it includes a great variety of structures, ranging from mosques, palaces, and granaries, to historic city centers, cultural landscapes, and archeological sites. Its cultural importance throughout the world is evident and has led to its consideration as a common heritage of humankind, therefore deserving protection and conservation by the international community. And this is a quote taken by the World Heritage Center that um, helps uh, uh, keep track of all the wonderful adobe earthen buildings around the world that uh, are on the World Heritage List. Going to the next slide, I just want to indicate that there's been a number of international symposia dealing with uh, the conservation of earthen architecture. Uh, professionals getting together since 1972 in places like Iran, Peru, Italy. We held a conference down in Las Cruces, New Mexico in 1990, where we had 300 delegates. Since then, it's been held in Portugal, England, Mali, Africa, France, other places. And I wanted to just mention that uh, the next symposium is going to be taking place in Santa Fe in, in 2022. So keep your eyes and ears open for that. There'll be a public component to that. 
and hopefully a lot of you that are here locally will be able to participate. Going to the next image, we're finally going to be talking about preserving adobe, and that's why we're here in part. Um, I just wanted to, to lay out a few basic uh, kind of do's and don'ts on adobe. With adobe, um, one would always want a positive drainage away from the walls. You don't want water to collect at the base of your adobe walls because that water collecting will just rise up, just like a, just like a wick, a wicking action. And it'll cause coving, which you can see an example of here at the bottom of the screen, a little uh, drawing, where you have this undercutting of the adobe wall. And that's caused again by the capillary rise of moisture and also by a lot of uh, rain and snow sometimes uh, sitting right there at the base. When you repair uh, or if needed replace anything on an adobe building you want to do that with like materials and Sean will be talking about this more in a minute. This building behind us used to be uh, stuccoed with cement and cement exists on a lot of historic buildings, historic adobes. It's not the best thing to have on your historic building. Uh, the majority of people have that. I live in a building, my wife and I live in a building, adobe building with cement stucco. But the best material is the same kind of material. You have an adobe brick, you want to have earthen plaster on top of it, adobe plaster on top of it. We want to, with adobes, we want to keep landscaping simple, uh, minimize any kind of concrete or asphalt surface around the building. You don't want sidewalks around the building because that'll tend to inhibit the uh, evaporation of moisture. The image on the lower right shows uh, my, my brother Pat, who's a real adobe expert down in southern New Mexico, working on uh, correcting, repairing, replacing um, deteriorated adobe at the base of a wall uh, in the historic village of Mesilla. And going to the next slide, uh, if you have a, a pitched roof on your adobe, uh, you want to be sure and keep the canales and the gutters and the downspouts clean. You want to make sure that those downspouts don't just bring the water down at the base of the wall because it'll just keep it'll just go up again. You want to have that water go out away from the walls. And you want to carry out a very uh, systematic monitoring with a checklist on a regular, regular basis, hopefully a cyclical annual basis. I show this image on the right because this, this is an image of the front of a book called Adobe Conservation. Adobe Conservation is written by um, Cornerstones Community Partnerships, a great uh, nonprofit organization based here in Santa Fe. It's helped to restore, maintain uh, historic churches and kivas uh, throughout New Mexico and the greater Southwest for almost 30 years. And this book is just incredible. It's a, it's a great how-to book. So if you're interested in getting this, uh, please go to your lo local bookseller and uh, ask them to find a copy for you. It's still in print. So with that, we're, uh, we're at the last image I'm going to be showing. Um, this is an image of the, of the Pino House, a building that we're standing in front of. The Pino House was built in the 19, early 1900s, made out of adobe. And to me and to many others, the, to the board, to staff, to volunteers, it's, we're starting to understand the importance of this building for our museum. It's a building that really uh, shows the continuum, the continuum of farming and ranching um, here in the La Cienega Valley. One final thing I just wanted to mention of the La Cienega Valley, all these buildings that I said that were built uh, in the 1970s, these were built by local artisans here in La Cienega Valley. Local maestros, local people that really knew how to work with that. And, and in my mind and many other people's mind, the tradition of keeping the adobe alive is just as important. A good friend of mine uh, had a quote um, and he said, all you need for an adobe building is a good hat, meaning a good roof, and good boots, meaning a good foundation. And behind us, we see an excellent example of that here at the Pino House. So with that, I'm gonna be turning over the next segment uh, to Sean, and he's gonna be showing us some techniques, talking about some of the details on how we've been able to best preserve and protect and use the Pino House. Sean? My name is Sean Palahimo. I'm the assistant director here at El Rancho de las Golondrinas and the director of operations. 
Uh, thank you again, Mr. Taylor, who's still with us. He's gonna ask me the harder questions here in a minute for your PowerPoint preservation. So I'm gonna talk um, a little bit more, do a little bit of a hands-on demonstration on Adobe materials and uh, the mixture of Adobe and just the application of Adobe. And again, uh, not to get too redundant, um, I was talking about the Pinot house behind us here. Uh, you can see Adobe was covered in concrete for a while, but the great thing about this building, we think it was built in 1918, making it just over 100 years old. We have a great rock foundation, which keeps that capillary seepage that Mike Taylor was talking about from going up into the building and allowing the foundation to start to crumble from the ground up, which is the worst thing that you could have happen. And we also have a great cantilevered roof that you can see behind me, which keeps water from dripping on the sides of your building, as opposed to a lot of the buildings you see in northern New Mexico, which have parapets and need to get replastered quite a bit more often. Uh, we're thinking the plaster on this building is going to last us a good five, maybe 10 years before we have to do a, a reapplication of mud plastering. I'm going to apply a little bit of plaster to the building uh, just as a demonstration here in a couple of minutes. So. First, I want to just talk about how do you know the mixture of your mud to your sand or your clay to sand ratio when you're making an adobe brick or making an adobe plaster coat. And there's a couple of techniques. The first one I'm going to talk about here is called the shake test. So you can see this jar. I took my dirt from an arroyo and I put it into this jar and I shook it up and let it settle overnight. So you can see my aggregate and my sand fell to the bottom and then my caliche and my clay settled on top. So I can tell that I've got, oh, sorry, about a 50-50 uh, ratio um, to sand to clay. Uh, that's not what we want though, as uh, Mr. Taylor was describing. We want a little bit more sand. We want about 70 to 30% clay. So when I mix this, I do add a little bit more sand to my mixture so that my adobe doesn't crack. I found that the shake test is not exactly accurate. So my favorite test is what I call the ball test, where I mix my different ratios into little balls. So I know how much each one of these ratios are. I use a measuring cup just to make a small amount of adobe. And you can see here that this one cracked. And there's a, a small line. I don't know if you can see it from there on the camera, but it's hard as a rock, which is what you want, but it did crack in the sun, which means there's just a little bit too much clay. My second test was about 50 sand, 50 of my original mixture. And which was screened dirt. And I'll show you how we do the screening process here in a minute. And that's just to remove any organic material, roots, leaves, um, bigger rocks, which bigger rocks in an adobe brick don't matter as much as they do in your plaster. And then this last one is, I added about three parts sand to about one part uh, clay. And what you can see is it just really wants to, the sand just wants to flake off of there. And that's not gonna last as plaster for very long. So after doing my three tests, I kind of came to the conclusion that I like to have about two and a half parts of uh, my clay to two parts sand. And that seems to be a really good hard as a rock mixture. And I found that that's my most reliable way of finding my mixture. So that's the way I use it. But the shake test is a, is a worthwhile thing to do as well. I was talking about the screening of the dirt earlier. And the reason you do that is to get out your organic material. And can you see me if I'm right here? So when we screen the dirt, all we're using is a diamond lath which is the diamond lath that you would see on the side of a house. And we make our little screening board here. And it's a pretty easy process. 
of running your dirt over your screen. And as you do that, you get a little bit of a, a messy situation. <laughs> but what you do end up with is a very fine powdered adobe or a powdered clay that you can add to your adobe mixture. The reason that we do that, again, is to remove your bigger rocks and your bigger aggregate. If you're making adobe bricks, you can get away with a little bit larger of a screen. The larger screen would allow bigger rocks to fall through, but in a brick, you're not worrying about leaving lines when you put your plaster onto the wall. So once you've done your screening and you can make your mud mixture, you already know your ratio. If in making a brick, this is a, a traditional brick mold. Uh, brick molds can come in different sizes. This is a pretty typical size for uh, New Mexico. The Adobe Man in Alcalde uses these exact dimensions, which I am blanking on right now. I think it's 14 by 11 is the standard for New Mexico, but you can look that up online as well. Uh, when you're making a brick with this mold, you put your mud mixture into the mold, pack it down so your corners get full, and you can do that just right on your, your earth out here, preferably in the sun, because you want your brick to dry. And after you've made your four bricks, the mud will stand up. So you can pull this mold away from your brick and continue to use this mold, wetting it down every time to make multiples of four bricks all day long. You could make 100 bricks out of this one mold in one day, just continuing on down the line, depending on how much land you have and, and how much dirt you have too, I guess. Any, any questions so far from our small studio audience? Not yet? Okay. So, mud bricks and mud plaster, pretty much the same exact mix mixture. Um, one thing I did not mention is the paja, the straw. Now, the straw is essentially, if you think of concrete work, it's the rebar of your mud mixture. It's organic material that's not so abrasive that it's gonna make your brick crack, but it does create some stability to hold all that mud together once it dries. So I've always explained it or thought of it as kind of if you're making a, pouring a concrete floor, you always put down wire and that wire is gonna keep your floor from settling and uneven. It's gonna kind of just hold it all together in a grid. So when here at Golandrinas, we take our, our straw and we run it through a uh, chipper. And the reason we do that is you don't want your pieces of straw to be too fat and too long, because that could crack your brick and also it could leave striations in your plaster when you're putting it onto a wall or onto your orno or whatever it is, your home, whatever you're plastering, your office building, your historic office building in Santa Fe. So, to go back to the Pino House here, the big part of the preservation plan for us was to get that concrete layer off of the Pino House. That creates a whole bunch of problems having that concrete layer. The primary problem is any moisture that gets into that wall doesn't allow it to breathe. You can't get that moisture to wick out of that wall once you've put a cap of concrete on top of the wall. So what we did along with uh, the Historic Santa Fe Foundation, thank you so much to the Historical Santa Fe Foundation for uh, giving us the John Gamim uh, Scholar last year here at Rancho de las Colandrinas. He was an intern. Um, Ramon came out and with a grinder painstakingly cut every single block of concrete plaster off of this building. There's gonna be a link in the timeline where you can see a time lapse of Ramon going around this whole building, cutting off all of that concrete plaster and remudding the building. What this does again is now this adobe 
is able to breathe. The adobe is able to gain moisture when it rains, but right away it can just breathe and dry out. The inside of the building as well is painted with whitewash and some latex paint from earlier days, but that also allows the building to breathe from the outside in and the inside out. So again, now that we have the adobe plaster back on this building, we're confident that this building is going to be able to withstand, withstand another 100 years standing the way it is. So we're gonna cut to uh, another scene here and we're gonna mix up some mud and put it onto this building. All right, we're back again in the mixing portion of our demonstration here. Uh, I already have my mixture here in my uh, carreta. It's, uh, as I was saying, about 70-30. Some leaves blew in. Wouldn't be the end of the world. So the sand that we're using here is a uh, number eight plaster sand, which has a pretty good aggregate to it. There's some decent sized pebbles, which isn't bad for plastering. Um, a gentleman by the name of Ed Crocker, who I've worked with for quite some time, uh, would say that having some bigger pebbles when it does rain allows that water to drip off the pebble and doesn't take the sand and the plaster off of your wall as easily. Uh, this I do get from a local sand company here in Santa Fe. Again, you've got your straw, which you can see kind of how fine it really is after being run through that uh, uh, chipper mill. And we run it through the chipper mill a couple of times to get this kind of uh, just finer stuff so that you're not ending up with too many of these big guys that when you're plastering, they just, they're gonna leave a line as you run your uh, plana over the wall. So last but not least, our clay that is harvested locally here on site. Uh, we have an arroyo. I've been digging this sand or this clay out of the same arroyo since I was very young, probably 13 years old. They used to send me with the truck to go and uh, load up on this clay. So I've become pretty uh, familiar with the mixture here, but you can see how nice and powdery it gets after running it through your screen. Not too many big rocks. This is uh, what was at the end of the screen is your kind of bigger chunks of clay, a couple of bigger rocks, a um, couple of roots and pieces of wood and whatnot that you just don't need that in your mixture. So once you have your materials prepped, you can screen your sand too if you've uh, had your pile of sand out for let's say two, three months and you have a cat, you might wanna think about screening your sand. I'll just say that. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna mix up. Uh, oh, another thing about locally harvested dirt is w in the Spanish days, you wouldn't have wanted to drive or go anywhere far to get your dirt. I mean, it made very little sense. And as uh, Mr. Taylor was pointing out, uh, building downtown, the Sutaraño, the basement, was dug out because that's where they were harvesting the dirt for their adobes for. Pino House also has a Sutaraño. Uh, I can't prove it, but I'm pretty certain the reason that it has a basement is the exact same reason. They dug their dirt right here. Why would you dig it very far away from where you're building? You would make your bricks right out in front of your building. Why would you make your bricks far away and have to bring them back? So a lot of your harvesting would happen right where you were gonna build. Your job site would very typically be not at all far away from where you're trying to build. You might have to go to an arroyo to get your sand, but most of your caliche and your, your clay would be dug right on site. And then the building would start going up. A lot of buildings also here on the museum property, we have a couple 200 plus year old buildings that uh, we've had to do repair on the floorboards and you find a crawl space and not necessarily a basement, but we're pretty positive that the adobe were harvested right there where that crawl space was. So the last ingredient, which I like to do a little bit of a dry mix first. 
kind of like you would if you had a lime and cement mixture with a hydrated lime to make concrete for a modern job site, you doing a little bit of a dry mix is always a good idea. Adding a little bit more straw. Another uh, form of plaster that you saw a lot in New Mexico was, well, I don't know about a lot, but you would see some lime plaster, just mentioning lime for concrete. There were some uh, lime plastered buildings uh, here in New Mexico as well. So last ingredient, as I was saying, is your water. Your traditional five gallon bucket. And very similar to just mixing modern mortar, modern pre-mixed mortar. You don't want to put too much water in. If you do, you have to add some more material, but it's kind of easier just to add your water slowly. And you don't want it to be too runny and you don't want it to be dry. You just kind of, you'll, you feel it get to this really nice sticky point. And if you've made your test pelotas here, you, uh, you've already kind of played with your dirt and know what that point's gonna feel like. This is a mortar hoe. You can see it has those two holes and that allows your mixture to flow through so you're not getting as much resistance on your tool when you're pulling it through. But you can mix your mud even by hand. You can mix it with a shovel. You could mix it with a regular garden hoe. You can see that our tools here at Golandrinus are pretty well used. This used to be about three inches longer. Um, my staff here at Golandrinus plasters buildings about two months out of every year. And I don't get to work with them as much as I used to, but I would say that anymore, the guys here at Golandrinus are probably some of the foremost experts in mixing and applying mud to buildings. Uh, we do have a mud mixer, a mechanical mud mixer here on site, just because of the vastness of the property. We really do need to save time mixing every careta. The way I'm mixing it now would be a pretty uh, arduous task to say the least. So, That looks pretty good. We're going to cut to the, the next segment here, and I'm going to apply some of this to uh, the base of the building just uh, to show you all how that, that next process is done. OK, so again, um, I had mentioned that here we are at the Pino House. We left this window exposed so that uh, people can come and when they see the building can see the actual adobe brick. Uh, this is two courses deep. This wall is a very thick wall. And again, thank you to the uh, historic uh, Santa Fe Foundation for uh, giving us their intern last year. Uh, Ramon Dorado uh, did so much work on this building, put in hundreds of hours uh, cutting the plaster off and then replastering the building. And this is what he found. When he took that concrete off, it was also wired to the building. And this is, you can see some hole marks if you were here closer where the nails went into the building to hold the wire on for the concrete. And this is what we ended up with. And when he did that, he had some really nice big cavities and we needed to fill those in first.
So, playing with mud again. To make mud stick to mud, you got to get it a little wet. And this is a kind of a kind of a fun part of playing with mud is to get it in there. The easiest way to do it is to practice a little bit of your baseball pitch. I was a soccer player. There we go. And really can get it in there before you can even do your first application of a scratch coat to get to this nice final final finish coat here. So this is what he was faced with when we first exposed the adobe on this building uh, to preserve uh, the building in its entirety and get it replastered with uh, this mud that we love. And really that was the first, uh, you know, application of all of his adobe plaster was just going around filling in these deep cavities. So now we're gonna go around the corner to the, our other wall here. All right, so I'm just gonna apply a little scratch coat of plaster over a part of plaster that if there's no adobe exposed, there's really no reason to be plastering over this, but just for our purposes today, I'm just gonna kind of show the application um, of some mud to the side of this building, very much like uh, traditional stucco is done, uh, but with your mud. Again, you, you wanna wet it. When we're doing large uh, parts of buildings, we use a, a sprayer on a hose. The brush technique would take all day, but for our purposes, it works. And then you have your application cool, the tool, the, the plana here. And then this is your hockey. I'm sure they have English names. I don't know what they are, but that's what we've always called them here. So, in your application, it's always easiest to start low and go in an, an upward motion. And once you've got your once you've got your mud applied to the wall, and you know if you're doing a whole wall, you would go down a bit further to get this nice smooth finish. You'd even add a little bit of water to that there, and then. Just come, a, come across nice and smooth. So you can imagine if you had this whole wall covered, you would be coming across. And this is just something I learned today that uh, from Mr. Taylor that it, it is better to go in a uh, horizontal motion as opposed to a vertical motion to keep the uh, water when it's dripping down from just catching your little pieces of straw and creating erosion marks. I learned that just today, learn something new every day. So you can imagine to do that one little square foot took me, I don't know, 30 seconds. So to do an entire wall, you, know, you could probably get, you, my guys can usually get a entire, I don't know, 12 by, 50 foot wall done in a day without any problem at all. It really takes almost more time to mix the mud than it does to apply it. And there you have it. So any questions uh, you can leave in the comment box or in our Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. And I'm gonna bring uh, Miss Laura back in to, uh, to see us out. 
Wow, what an incredible and informative presentation that was. Thank you again to Sean and Michael for spending some time with us today to share a little bit about the, to share a lot actually about the traditional techniques and methods about adobe making and adobe preservation. Um, that was really interesting to get to a little sneak peek of what goes on here on site at El Rancho de las Colondrinas. It's a lot of hard work to maintain all of our beautiful historic buildings and we sure do appreciate Sean and his team for doing that. Um, and Michael, thank you so much again for coming out today, and thank you for your continued dedicated service on the board of Las Golondrinas. We sure appreciate that. Um, remember, folks, you can check out all of the videos that we've made. They're going to be right here on our Facebook page. Um, keep up with us again also on our Instagram page at sfgolondrinas.org. All of these videos, if you have friends or family who are interested that you want to share these with, but if they don't have a Facebook Facebook page, make sure to direct them to our YouTube page. Just look up Las Golondrinas channel right there on YouTube. You'll see a series of our Golondrinas live session videos. Um, and again, any other information, go to our website, www.golondrinas.org. We are continuing to be open here on site for beautiful autumn walks until Friday, October 30th. All that information is right there on our homepage. You can purchase your tickets. If you have any questions at all, feel free to drop us a line. And as Sean mentioned, if you have any questions about this presentation, leave them in the body of the comments there on Facebook, and we'll make sure to answer those for you as promptly as we can. And before we close for today, uh, Mike Taylor had a couple of closing remarks that he wanted to share with you all. So thanks again so much, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you very much, Laura. And thank you so much, Sean, for a great demonstration. We really appreciated it. I am uh, very fortunate to be a board member here at Rancho de las Golondrinas. I serve with a number of other incredible board members. And um, I just wanted to point out that uh, we all love this place so much, uh, and we love it because of two major things, the volunteers that work here and that keep this place going, and the incredible staff that we have. So I urge you all to come out when you can and when, uh, when circumstances are better for uh, the events to get going again. One thing that I just wanted to mention was that um, because there hasn't been events this year because of COVID, if you feel so inclined, no pressure at all, but if you feel so inclined, there's a donate button on our website. So if you feel like donating anything, uh, please go ahead and do that. And again, no pressure. But thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you out here at the museum soon. Thank you.